the title of the forum this evening is The War in Syria, Abuses of Human Rights and the Destruction of Culture. The civil war in Syria has entered its seventh year, with the death toll estimates ranging from 220,000 to 400,000 casualties and more than 11 million civilians internally displaced or seeking refuge abroad. It has been described as the world's deadliest conflict of recent times. In this forum, a panel of experts will explore political, cultural and humanitarian dimensions of the Syrian tragedy. I'd like to start by introducing our speakers and our first uh, presenter is Dr. Ross Burns. Dr. Ross Burns was a career officer of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for 37 years. In that time, he had a range of overseas postings and served as ambassador to several Middle Eastern countries. He recently completed doctorate at Macquarie University and is adjunct professor in the Department of Ancient History at Macquarie University. He has published three books on the history and monuments of Syria. Aleppo, A History in 2016, Monuments of Syria in 2009, and Damascus, A History 2005. His website, uh, monumentsofsyria.com, contains a rich store of photos of archaeological sites in Syria. Our second speaker is Dr. Eil Mayros, who's a lecturer in the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies, University of Sydney. His research interests include genocide studies, counterterrorism, human rights and Middle Eastern politics. He is a member of the Genocide Prevention Advisory Network and has authored a number of book chapters and journal articles on atrocity prevention, as well as an upcoming book, Ever Again, America's Failure to Halt Genocide, from Bosnia to Darfur. I'd like to introduce our third speaker, Mael Jandali. Malik was German-born Syrian-American composer and pianist. Malik uh, was get grown up uh, in Syria, in the city of Homs, before leaving Syria to study music in America. He has spoken at Harvard University, Duke University, and the UN headquarters in New York City. He is the founder of Pianos for Peace, a non-profit organization which aims to build peace through music and education. Malik was honored with the 2013 Guzi International Peace Prize for his ongoing world tour, The Voice of the Free Syrian Children, and also the recipient of the 2014 Music, Global Music Humanitarian Award. In 2015, he was named a great immigrant by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. I just wanted to say personally that uh, Malik is here in his first inaugural uh, visit to Australia as part of um, uh, his Syrian Symphony for Peace tour uh, during uh, National Refugee Week, uh, which, was, uh, which took place last week. And I had the great uh, privilege to listen to um, Malik's music and uh, the Blau at the Blue in the Blau Blue Mountains Theatre. Uh, he played a musical composition called Echoes from Ugarit, um, which um, uh, many of you may know. Ugarit um, uh, is the place where the original musical notation of the world was discovered 3,400 years ago. So um, we were very uh, inspired by um, this beautiful composition um, that Malik played in the Blue Mountains recently. I'd like to also introduce the moderator, Dr. Wendy Lamborn. Dr. Wendy Lamborn is senior lecturer and currently acting chair of the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies. She has published widely about her research on trauma healing, transitional justice and peace building after genocide and other mass violence focusing on countries in sub-Saharan Africa and the Asia Pacific region. Her recent publications include chapters in Dimensions of Peace, Restorative Justice in Transitional Settings, 
and breaking cycles of repetition. I'd now like to start by calling our first speaker, Dr. Ross Burns. Thank you. I'm not sure how I get the PowerPoint. Oh, there it is. OK, right. Uh, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to in my old university, Sydney University, um, in the Sydney Ideas Forum. It's a forum I've heard a lot about in, in recent years. I never quite understood what it was, but now I get a better impression up close. But uh, thank you very much to the organisers. And I think it's a great honour to have with us tonight Malik Jandali, who is a distinguished Syrian-American composer. Um, and I, I've heard a couple of his interviews or musical performances on, on Radio National in the last few days and very, very impressed by what I've heard. So I think we're, I'm in distinguished company tonight and I feel a bit humbled by, by the occasion. But what I want to talk about tonight, I'm afraid, is, is bad news. It's what's been happening to the monuments of Syria. Uh, those of you who know me, and there are a few in the audience, um, might know that I wrote uh, 20 five years ago, 20 years ago, um, no, 27 years ago, a book called Monuments of Syria, which has come out in three different editions and, in, um, and luckily was revised just before the beginning of the crisis in Syria in 2011. So I've always kept my hand in on the archaeology of Syria, following up the wonderful weekends I used to be able to spend travelling over most of the country um, and, f and seeing uh, more of its, its wonderful history and meeting, of course, the, the extraordinary people who I think uh, just, have to be, uh, just have to be experienced to, to believe how wonderfully welcoming and, and friendly and, and fair-minded, I think, most people in, in Syria are. Now, let's just see if the technology works. Um, I just put up here these figures because I think what we want to remember at the beginning of any presentation about what's happening in Syria is the human toll of the disaster which has overtaken the country in the last um, six years. And I, I'll just let those figures speak for themselves. You'll see it's one of the most extraordinary uh, disastrous uh, conflicts of recent times, particularly as it's happening in a country which is so vital to, to many interests uh, in, in the Middle East and as the caught in the nexus between so many different uh, cultural, religious and ideological currents. But I always, when I do these lectures, I always point out that when you talk about the monuments, you have to see them in the country as a whole. And you have to see them in a country which has really almost collapsed in on itself, so that you can hardly expect any semblance of normal life to prevail except in the areas where some form of government control is still maintained and hopefully uh, maintained in a reasonably balanced and non-violent way. But I don't think we can expect to save the monuments or do anything about them as outsiders until the country is back under one, 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 one authority. But nor do I think the monuments should just be dismissed as some trivial aspect of the conflict because I think they're very, they're very important, not only to outsiders, who love, to visit, who love to visit Syria and to take in the wonderful panorama of history that it could offer, but also um, to the people of Syria themselves. And one, th one thing I noticed in my many visits, not only when I was there at the time, but also in going back in the last uh, 15 years, uh, has been the extraordinary rise in the level of interest in the Syrians themselves in their monuments, in their, in, their, uh, in their background, in the physical remains of their past, and in all its variety. And I think that's one thing that really is quite striking about Syria, the huge variety of its remains. But tonight, I wanted to start off, wanted to start off in Aleppo because I think to some extent it's been underplayed the extent to which uh, the conflict centred so much on the, the central historical area of Aleppo, 
Um, people were very much used to the pictures on television of the huge damage to the civilian population, particularly in eastern Aleppo. But uh, in the center of all this conflict between the two sides uh, was caught that area which you see there in the, in the blue box, the walled city of medieval Aleppo, one of the most extraordinary uh, remains of the medieval Islamic world which you could find anywhere. Now, I won't go into the details, but this shows you the footprint of that blue box of the walled city on the, on the spread of the whole city. Aleppo is, the, is now known to be the largest city, in, or was before 2011, the largest city in Syria, uh, even though it's not the capital, but it's economically more important than Damascus. And it's spread in all directions from that central walled area. But the conflict came in on, that, on that, uh, that, that blue box from two directions, from the, the rebel forces, which are in the sort of browny red uh, colored area. Um, sorry, on the, on the right hand, on the, on, sorry, it's, this is a rather confusing map because they, would, they use the wrong colors in my experience. But uh, uh, it, it was caught anyway between the areas held by the rebels and the, the browny red areas held by the regime. But the two shapes sort of interlocked on each other, so it presented a very confusing picture. But what I want to focus on is the picture in that central blue box area and how it was affected by the conflict. So this is a close-up of that area in, of downtown Aleppo between on the on the right over there, the great citadel which looms over the, over the city and the main spine of the city which has existed since probably the second millennium BC because it was the route which joined the first settlement in Aleppo over here with the great religious centre which was situated on top of the hill which is now the citadel of Aleppo. So we're just going to look at closely, a bit more closely at a couple of buildings in this area to give you just a small flavor of the enormous complexity of Aleppo's history. I'll just quickly flick up this map though because I think it gives you a very good impression of how partial the damage has been. You can see here, this is uh, the, uh, the UN satellite uh, tracking services map of conflict zones around Aleppo. Here is our blue box of the historic city. Here you get this great sweep of areas which have been subject to the extraordinary shelling, mainly from the, from the regime's positions over here in the west, um, and wrapping around the city from, from three sides. Uh, this area on the west here is where the civilian population who remained under, under the regime's control were concentrated for most of the last four or five years. But you can see that the area of damage is very much confined mainly to the, to the west, to the east, with the red areas being the most severe zones of destruction, and that zone cuts right across the historic city, as you can see there. This is just highlighting those areas a bit more clearly for you. But let's focus first on the Aleppo Citadel, which is the as I said, it was the original hill uh, which housed the first Bronze Age temple in the, uh, in the city. And the axis spread from that hill down here to the left uh, towards the river. And, uh, and that axis became the, the axis of, the, of all the cities since then for the last uh, 5,000 years. What sort of city was Aleppo? It was very much one which attracted the interest of uh, Western visitors, particularly Europeans, since about the uh, 13th, 14th century. And it housed a quite considerable trading community because of its role at the Western end of the Silk Route, bringing some of the more exotic products from the East to the European market. So it became known as a very congenial city for which uh, in which to house European, the European trading presence. And it built up a reputation uh, particularly for the, the beauty of its remains 
and the, the, the welcome received from the, from the inhabitants. What you see there is the view of the city from the hill at the west, the Jebel Joshan. And, but this, now we, we come in close up to the citadel. This is an aerial view of the citadel. You can see that there is very little today left inside the walls. That's because ever since the 12th, 13th century, it's remained a very active military base um, and was only really cleared out in the middle of the last century. Uh, so there is not too much remains in, in, the, in the citadel itself. But as you can see there, the walls of the citadel, as they were in the 12th, 13th century, still survive. So it's very much a citadel which looms over the city still. There you can see the, the main entrance to the citadel, in fact, the, the sole entrance to the citadel, with the great medieval walls and this enormous double gateway with the, the bridge in between. I won't go into any detail about the, the Bronze Age remains, but the, the most important discovery on the citadel in recent years has been this, uh, this site here, which is the temple of the Bronze and Iron Age weather god, who was a very important figure in the religious uh, pantheon of Syria in the, in the pre-classical pre period. And that's the, the dig which was begun in the 1990s by the Germans to expose this temple, which, uh, which housed the, uh, the, the, the uh, cult of the weather god. But let's return to that area in front of the great gateway to the citadel, because I, for the first of our disaster uh, episodes tonight, I'd like to concentrate on that area, which has been very much central to the development of the historic city, particularly since the 12th century, when it became such an important bastion for the Islamic resistance to the Crusades. Now just under that gate gateway you see this rather humble or rather undecorated um, madrasa or, or Islamic school which houses over here the tomb of a great Islamic leader of the late 12th century. He happened to be a son of Saladin and he was by far the most successful of Saladin's sons in setting up a principality under the, under the, uh, under the Ayyubid uh, uh, realm which spread from Egypt to, uh, to Syria and into northern Iraq. So his period of stability was very much the basis of much of the success of 12th, 13th century uh, Aleppo's architecture. But I'm afraid as the conflict developed here, you can see the lines of confrontation. What I've got here in the blue zone is the areas held by the regime who maintained access to the citadel. Here to the south of that zone, you had areas held by various rebel factions and you have the biggest concentration of the, the fighting was in this red box here between the regime up here and the rebels in the downtown area of, with all its souks madrasas, uh, minarets, etc. So Aleppo really became involved as a central player in the confrontation which was overtaking the, the northern Syria at the time. This is a picture I took just at the beginning of the crisis, um, just before the beginning of the crisis, uh, from the, from the gateway to the, to the uh, Aleppo Citadel. You can see here a rather beautiful beautification program which had just been finished. You can see all the trees are new. Uh, this was done under the Aga Khan's uh, uh, funding in, in the last few years. But I'm afraid all of these buildings which are marked with the red uh, labels are now gone as a result of the fighting in this area. I won't go into great detail, but basically what happened was that here is the Citadel Gateway. This is that area we've just been looking at. Uh, this is the result seen from the Citadel. Uh, this is a satellite image showing that virtually all those buildings have just been sucked into enormous destruction caverns in the ground. All of these were, were toppled by, by tunnels being driven 
from the rebel side here underneath the buildings and just setting off immense quantities of explosives. Now this has never got very much publicity, but it's by far the most destructive episode in the history of Aleppo in the last five years. And of course it was funded by Islamic elements who very much got their inspiration and a lot of their funding from the Gulf states. The ones, by the way, which as we'll see later, Donald Trump has been boosting as the answer to extremism in the Middle East. Now we'll just head a little bit further west down that axis here, and I won't look at all these buildings, but I want to just concentrate on this one, the Khosrafiya Mosque, which was built by the great uh, Turkish architect Sinan, who was commissioned by uh, Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, of course, he was, he was practicing as an architect for well over 40 years, but this is his first, or this was his first mosque. And it's a rather beautiful example of the simple uh, Ottoman style before it became jazzed up in later decades. But this is one of those buildings that was toppled by, by, the, by the rebels in their tunneling, tunnel bombing efforts. And that you see as a result. You can see how effective tunnel bombing is. It virtually leaves no stone upon another stone. It's turned to, to minute rubble and to a sort of powder. Now the second area I want to look at quickly, if I can be permitted a little bit more time, uh, is the Great Mosque, because it's by far the most significant religious building in the city. Um, and you can see here in its splendor, it's right in the center of that ax axis between the citadel and, and the western walls and the river. But what I want to look at very briefly, oops, well, here we are. What I want to look at of now I've disappeared, but uh, I want to look particularly at the eastern side of the courtyard here, uh, which housed the, the mosque's uh, important collection of manuscripts and this beautiful minaret, which is a late 11th century minaret just before the Crusades, constructed under the Seljuks when they were in control of the city, but in a style quite, ex quite different from the Seljuk style found today in Iran, Iraq and in, uh, in Turkey. But I'm afraid it was toppled about a year, about six months or nine months into the conflict and you can see there the rubble left by the remains of the, of the explosion. I, it's never been clarified whether it was blown up by the rebels or whether it was blown up by the regime because they wanted to take out a rebel position here which was firing into their positions on the, on the northern side of the city. But uh, certainly I think the way it's fallen is probably an indication that it was taken out by tank fire and that must mean the Syrian regime. Here is the other major area, area of damage, the library of the mosque. And that, that shows that area where the library is housed, that's what it was like before. And this shows a bit more from a different angle, the remains of the minaret. Here I won't go into detail, but this, this is, shows you the beautiful shape of the minaret, its towering height and the extraordinary range of detailed decoration which, which uh, uh, was carried out at several levels. Uh, well, we've probably only got time now to just briefly look at this, but this is, this is a, a, a slide I've, I've, I've developed from my, I've, I think we've mentioned my website has a sort of a running cumulative list of damage to monuments in, in the conflict in Syria. Um, and this is, this is a table taken from the, the cumulative total of monuments that have been affected. I only use uh, visual evidence which is provided on the internet. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't take postings from, I don't take reports from the media because they're often just repeating the same story and has not necessarily been, been checked, nor of course is it possible in many places to, to check. But uh, it doesn't include a lot of other information about illegal digging, etc. But you can see there, I, my, I classify the monuments under five different levels of destruction. And this is the number of monuments which I think 
fall into those different levels in Aleppo. And just for point of comparison, over in, in Palmyra on the right, because these two cities are the two which have suffered most from the conflict in terms of the massive level of damage to, uh, to their historical fabric. Now, one thing I try to counter in these talks is the belief that, oh, well, it's all gone. It must be destroyed. It hasn't all been destroyed. And one of the points of, the, of these figures is to show that the greater weight of buildings actually can be reconstructed reasonably easily uh, with the right skills and the right materials. And both of those are available in Syria. So I think if, if people keep on assuming that everything is gone, then they'll just turn their attention elsewhere. It's often been the case that uh, the media or postings on the internet have described damage as being major or total destruction, when in fact the level of destruction is much more minor and is very partial and could be, uh, could be uh, repaired. So, just a reminder of the, the level of damage across the city and some other conclusions. I, I've compiled my database on the, uh, and, and it's, it leads to the conclusion, I think, that there, is no, uh, there are no angels when it comes to the archaeology, the destruction of the archaeology in Syria. Some things can be attributed to the regime, but the regime has also done a lot to preserve sites and to take precautions to prevent uh, material being damaged. But certainly, the biggest acts of deliberate destruction, where monuments have been singled out because they are monuments of a different culture that they may not approve of, has been done by the forces who are on the Islamic side, particularly, of course, in the most celebrated incidents by so-called Islamic State. I think, too, it has to be remembered that Syria does have the skills base Hopefully, a high proportion of the people who used to work as masons and engineers and builders uh, would be available after the con conflict is ended, and a quick start program to get some buildings back in, back in shape would, I think, be a, should be a major part of the reconstruction. What I think we should do as outsiders, though, is avoid doing anything which is going to make things worse. And I think a lot of things which have been said and done over the last six years, including some things which have been done for, with the best of intentions, uh, haven't been helpful and have fanned the conflict, given it more dimensions uh, and, and allowed it to invite in even more external players. But I think it's been underestimated over the last five years the extent to which funding, particularly from the Gulf states, has contributed to the Islamic cause in Syria and given a, a proportion which has become entirely dangerous to the future of the country. So I won't go into any more detail, but just to say that this is Donald Trump, of course, on the visit to Riyadh, where he began to beat the drum about uh, how, how good the Saudis have been um, in countering Islamic extreme, extremism. And to that I can only say, phooey. <laughs> uh, they have been a major cause of funding to the Islamist groups. The, the uh, Saudi Arabia is, is the sort of the, 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 the seed of the whole idea of Islamic fundamentalism, which has taken hold of many movements uh, these days. But I think you're all aware of that. But I think what we should be doing is avoiding any impression that these tensions between Shia and Sunni in particular uh, as something which we can play a, a role in encouraging or resolving. Nothing could be more dangerous, I think. What I would like people to do is what's described in the last, or the postscript to my book, which is to reflect on buildings like this one. This is another beautiful Ayyubid building just outside Aleppo, uh, which commemorates Hussein. Now, of course, Hussein is very much favoured in the Shia tradition, not so much in the Sunni tradition, but uh, the Sunni rulers of Aleppo always managed to acknowledge the importance of the Shia community in the city attached to Hussein and to the whole 
tradition on the, on the Shia side. And so this monument and another one nearby were very much uh, endowed by, by the, uh, by the particularly of the, the regimes of the Mamluks and, sorry, the Ayyubids and the Mamluks. Um, and that was the way these tensions were handled in, the, in centuries past. People may not have approved of Shiite traditions in a Sunni-dominated city like Aleppo, but they weren't going to make an issue of it. And that, I think, is what is the big lesson we should be taking from events at, at this time. Okay, I've probably taken up more time than I should, but uh, the rest we can leave for, for the uh, Q&A session at the end. Thank you. Dr. Burns. I'd like to call on our second speaker, Dr. A.L. Mayrose. Good evening, and thank you, Ross, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm very honored to be here to tag along these yes. very two distinguished speakers. Um, in December of 2015, I uh, attended a three-day meeting at the United Nations. The group I'm affiliated with advises governments and the UN on mass atrocity prevention. And the, uh, the uh, meeting was uh, a few weeks after the beginning of the big, big chung with uh, the uh, Paris terrorist attack. And so the focus, while the focus was supposed to be in Syria, what the governments that invited us wanted to talk about was about uh, radical Islam terrorism. And on one hand, I understood that because of the connection to the, to the uh, Paris attack. But on the other hand, having spent years trying to explain to myself and to others the reason behind the failure of the international community to stop or prevent genocide, the amount of political will and the amount of public interest that I suddenly saw coming out in relation to what was going on in Paris compared to what I was so used to over the years in relation to Syria and other places was just staggering. I was virtually sitting at the UN and feeling the eyes of hundreds of thousands of Syrians, of Sudanese, of, of Congolese uh, looking at us and asking why is the world that let them die is all of a sudden so concerned if, about a few more bodies. So before I proceed, I want to make three quick uh, arguments, which may sound quite simple, but that I think if we really uh, embed those in our minds, uh, the world could be different. And it's arguments about suffering. So the first argument is that there is no distinction whatsoever between French suffering Syrian suffering, and for that purpose, Australian suffering. And the second argument is that there is no difference between Christian pain, Muslim pain, or Buddhist pain, or Hindu pain. Suffering is suffering, and pain is pain. But I'd like to make a third argument about suffering, and that is that the, the uh, suffering caused by terrorism is no, difference to, no different to the suffering caused by war crimes or even by genocide. What is different are the uh, motives, the consequences, sometimes the scope, and often the responses of the international community to these crimes. So what I'm, I don't have much time, but what I wanted to do is to go through very quickly through a few uh, characteristics, uh, challenges and, and mistakes being done in relation to the civil war in Syria, and then highlight some things in the areas that I'm uh, most interested in, and I hope that uh, we can maybe touch on other things uh, during the Q&A at the end. So, um, so after six years, the war has caused physical, societal and cultural destruction in Syria. We saw the use of, uh, of uh, chemical weapons 
A genocide has been perpetrated against minorities in both Syria and Iraq. And two ancillary, initially ancillary processes that were part of the war became the focus of the international community instead of the welfare of the Syrian people. And that's the what we call global terrorism and the European refugee crisis. In terms of uh, challenges, I, I wanted to highlight uh, three or four of those. Of course, the geostrategic power struggles uh, between both regional and global powers that was on the back of the Syrian people. The second are the sectarian dimension that Ross has mentioned. And the third is the uh, situation with the opposition, what started off as, as, a, as a grassroots secular movement uh, for reform very quickly turned into uh, a, a, an opposition that initially was cohesive but very soon splintered into more than 100 uh, groups. And this is just a snapshot of the, of the uh, geostrategic complexity that we see. Uh, US versus Russia, Saudi Arabia versus Iran on, on a regional basis, Turkey against the Kurds, everyone against ISIS, a whole, uh, a whole fiasco of very powerful interests that, again, uh, uh, governments uh, pursue on the back of the Syrian people. Uh, I, I singled out three major mistakes in my view. Uh, some of them are being often mentioned, others may not be as often mentioned. Uh, in relation to how the UN and the international community dealt with the uh, crisis. The first, of course, is the insistence on regime change, that, which came initially from the rebel groups in, in, from, with support from the, uh, from the Arab League and acquiescence by the United Nations, by the Security Council. And I, I can empathize with the feeling, but on the other hand, to put such a demand as a precondition for uh, peace negotiations just put the regime in a corner where there was no other alternative other than to fight. So that was a big mistake and I recently uh, talked to a very senior UN officials about it and he agreed that that was the case. The second is uh, uh, misconceptions about what, what, uh, where the uh, Syrian army would go. Again, I'm not a Syria expert. My area is genocide studies. But I've, I've been familiar with the, a bit with the Syrian army. I've been a, a familiar with the Egyptian army. And, and the, as the civil war in Syria came on the back of the Arab Spring, uh, many were looking at what was going on in, Syri in uh, Egypt, in Tunisia. And there were great hopes that the Syrian army would follow suit to what has happened in, with the Egyptian army. But I, I lived five years in Egypt, and I knew that the Egyptian army was very much embedded in, society, in Egyptian society, and so the, com the comparison was problematic. The, the uh, Syrian army, as far as I know, is very much embedded in the regime, and so although we did see mass defections, you could have, analysts could have predicted that it will not go the same way as, as, uh, as, Syri as uh, Egypt, and that really uh, uh, changed the course of the war or prevented the success of the rebellion. And the third is the, uh, that might be controversial to some people here, but uh, what I call the West refusal to concede to, to Russian demand. In 2012, a year after the, the uh, crisis started, I attended a meeting in, in Stockholm on, on the issue, and, and we talked to 16 governments there, and we told them after our, our specialists we talked together, we realized that in order to save the Syrian people, and, and as genocide scholars as people who deal with mass atrocity prevention, our main goal is to save life and, or lives. And we told them that inevitably, Russia is so embedded in Syria that unless we, the, the West finds common ground and inevitably having to concede to, to some of Russia's demand, uh, there will be no stop to the killing. And hundreds of thousands of victims later, I think the international community has realized that, so it's very unfortunate. Another problem with the coverage by the mainstream media, I think uh, many of us know that, and I will talk about it a bit later, but 
the amount of misinformation coming out of Syria just leaves us sitting outside and trying to work out what is happening in, in not only in the dark, but in a very bad uh, position in terms of making decisions, in terms of realizing what's going on. So I want to uh, dev uh, devote the rest of my talk to the area that I'm researching, which is, which is the relationship between public opinion and policy making. Where is the public in, in its effects or influences on policy making in the area of mass atrocity prevention? My focus has been mainly on the US, but, but I will talk here in some places more generally. And of course the question is, have we done what we can do, and why don't we do more? So there's a lot, there's a long list, and maybe an hour talk about the reasons why uh, people do things, why they don't do things. So I'll, I'll, I'll make it very brief. Uh, of course, the daily challenges of our life leave often for many of us very small patience, time, energy to, to worry about far away others, people outside our, our circle of, of moral concern. Uh, in relation to Syria, the complexity of the crisis, and we looked earlier at the picture of the different uh, uh, countries and different bodies that are entangled in the, conf in the, uh, in the conflict, are, are just so difficult to untangle, as well as the information coming out is so difficult to discern and to sift through. The protractedness of conflict, often when conflicts erupt, there is a lot of interest, but as they go along and nothing gets solved, people just get tired. Information gap, again, who to believe, is something that will continue to, to be very strong and a big problem in relation to Syria. And I highlighted the next one, no clear solution, and that's because as, as public, as ordinary citizens, we are often we do want to do something, we do want to help, but often we don't know what. And in that sense, we are often in the hands of officials, in the hands of the media. If the official line is, oh, we wish we could help, but there's nothing to do, then for public opinion, it's very difficult to push. What are we pushing? What are we telling our, our representatives to do? So it's a very big and important uh, point. The ISIS conundrum in the case of, of, uh, of uh, Syria, as we know, once initially there was a very strong international public opinion uh, against Assad, but once the alternative turned out to be possibly Syria in the hands of ISIS, then again, the, there's nothing to do became even more difficult and more complex. And the last one is uh, empathy, and I'd like to talk about empathy about the promise of empathy, about the challenges of empathy, and about what to do. So empathy has a lot of, uh, a lot of meanings. Uh, the most common one maybe is uh, kind of a combination of sympathy, kindness, caring, compassion. But if you talk to a psychologist, and I'm not a psychologist, they'll tell you that uh, empathy is something quite different. It's the ability or, or, or the tendency of the mind to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. And at the same time, often when it comes to empathy, it's to feel someone else's pain. In, in fact, research has shown that when we see or hear someone else's pain, we may be actually feeling in our brain there might be certain areas that are responsible for pain that fire up, and so we feel the suffering of others. So these are the two main uh, systems in the, in the brain, the first of which is responsible for the generation of empathy, the experiential or intuitive system, uh, which fires very quickly, very rapidly, and can evo invoke uh, empathy. The second one is slower, more analytic, more uh, involves more uh, thoughts processes. And in, in some cases, and we, of, we are all familiar with that, empathy can lead to action, we empathize towards somebody, often somebody who's close to us, uh, a relative or a friend, or even in our own society, and we do something to help them. But empathy has a lot of challenges, so much so that uh, Paul Bloom from Yale University uh, calls for a campaign against empathy. 
So problems with empathy, we talked about suffering. If, if we feel the suffering of others, is that something we want to experience? Is that something that is pleasant? No, it's not. And, and the way our mind works is that we are protected against feeling the suffering of others. Otherwise, we, we, our life will be hell. The second point is that it's easier to empathize with one victim than with many. Uh, Mother Teresa said, if I look at the mass, I will never act. But if I look at one, I will. Another great humanitarian, uh, Joseph Stalin, said that one death is a tragedy and one million is a statistics. And indeed, our research has shown that uh, our ability to empathize with the many is, is very problematic. They actually found out that you empathize more with one person than with two. And you empathize more with two than with four. And when it comes to million, our empathy, as measured by research, is very limited. Another point is that it's more difficult to empathize with victims of man-made atrocities than of uh, uh, natural disasters. And we've all, uh, or maybe hopefully, remember uh, 2004 and the tsunami disaster and the amount of empathy and, and international organization that led to such heartwarming uh, uh, um, campaigns to help the victims of, of uh, the tsunami. Compared to what is happening in Syria, compared to what has been happening in relation to Darfur in Sudan. And, and there, are, there are various reasons for that which are quite interesting. Again, research, social psychology research. Uh, the greater complexity of man-made tra tragedies make it much more difficult for us to understand. Uh, we don't know who's culpable, who, who to blame, who are the victims. Uh, why don't they do more? This is a question often asked. They measured how, uh, the, the willingness of people to donate funds, for example, for tragedies. Why don't they help themselves? Uh, we talked about what to do. When you donate to a natural disaster, you know that the money you're giving is going to go to the right place and will do the right thing. But when it comes to man-made tragedy, what can you do? What, what can you do that will make a difference? And it's very difficult. Um, and of course, as the conflict wears along, our ability to focus on it, our ability to stay interested is, is quite limited, which leads to compassion fatigue. Another problem is that has to do with identification. Identifying with victims can lead to vi empathy, but it can on, also lead to things that we don't like, such as fear, hate, anger, revenge. And some of the worst catastrophes catastrophe, sorry, in, in, in the world have been partly to do with empathy that led to anger. For example, they say that in, in Rwanda, the, the anger towards the Tutsi uh, was played some part in the mob mass mobilization of the Hutu against the Tutsi. And maybe Wendy may say it's not, but this is, and fear, of course, fear. I'm going to talk about fear next. So that's fear. Um, and research again has found that the same part of the mind that is in charge of generating empathy also uh, relates to fear. And so they found out that when we are afraid, our ability to generate empathy is very limited. I mentioned identification and I'll talk about it now. Uh, this is after, of course, uh, the, uh, the uh, Paris attacks. And all over the West, you would see we are all Parisians. Uh, just to mention that in the same year, there were three, at least three, even more major terrorist attacks in Ankara, in Beirut, and in Kenya, that uh, we didn't see these signs anywhere. So empathy has to do with identifying with the victims. And in the case of fear, all of a sudden, when we hear about here in Australia about Syria, then we, are, we may be bystanders. But when we hear about Paris, we are all of a sudden potential victims. It could have been us, or it could be us tomorrow, or next month, or next year. And indeed, identification is influenced by, by a number of, of uh, you know, causes. 
physical, emotional, cultural, religious, uh, ethnicity, skin color, language, in-group or out-group, a whole range of things that influence how and to what extent we identify with others. And then we talk about the empathy conundrum where the people that often need our help the most are the people, especially in the West, are the people we identify the least with. And so low identification often leads to indifference and to inaction. Now there's been many attempts to solve the Syrian crisis. And I don't have any, any magic uh, bullet here, but just some points to think about mainly in terms of, of us citizens. The first thing is to do with uh, information. We are fed continuously by a range of sources of information. Some, I'm not saying that they, that they lie, but a lot of them are coming from a certain interest and they highlight certain things and they may be hiding certain or ignoring certain other things. So in terms of us trying to make sense of what is happening, I encourage us all to be very discriminative about the information that we are exposed to and asking the right questions and see what, what is missing from the picture. Because if we know what is happening, it is easier to think or, or form an opinion and to know what can be done, what can't be done. Uh, Paul Bloom suggested that because of the problems associated with empathy, that we need to have much better laws and institutional arrangements at the international level mainly, but of course international level is many states together, uh, that will replace or augment or protect against the failures of empathy. So we're talking about international law, we're talking about procedures and, and actions at the UN level. And we should always remember that in silent societies, governments have a lot of freedom to uh, make their own policies, including harmful and immoral policies. And finally, cultivate compassion. Now compassion, I won't go into a lecture about compassion, but compassion is quite different to empathy. It comes from a different place. It is a lot more removed. It's not associated with a lot of the things that we talked about earlier when we talked about uh, um, empathy. And so it's something that can and needs to be cultivated and trained. And it's something that we need to have not only in relation to uh, people outside, but even people next to us. And so, for example, in, in England, a research has found that the least compassion we had, people had was to the fans of, of uh, their rival uh, soccer team. <laughs> so I hope that when we get to the Q&A session, we will uh, hopefully holding very strong views, but hopefully we'll feel compassion towards one another. And finally, prevention is always the answer, and so make public stakeholders in prevention efforts and address conflict before they deteriorate into mass violence, destabilize region, generate refugees, refugee flows, and create safe havens for terrorist groups. So uh, I thank you very much. I'd like to call on our um, third speaker, last speaker, Malik Jandali. Thank you, Malik. Salam, peace, and shalom. My name is Malik Jandali, and I'm the only Syrian on the panel. And I would like to uh, clarify a couple of points. I don't belong to any organization or a political party, except my own organization, Pianos for Peace. <laughs> and uh, I'm a musician on a mission, and I would like to start my portion with the video, please. And if you please turn off the lights, or lower them, dim the lights a little bit.
and started looking for my identity as a Syrian from an American perspective. Frankly speaking, I don't think a composer like me would have existed in Europe 50 years ago. I'm not mixing East and West. I'm taking my heritage as is and putting it in a symphonic form.
and the dictator was giving them death of all kinds. One particular Syrian touched my heart. He was a firefighter. He mobilized all those people. His name was Ibrahim Kashush. And he said, go away, Bashar. We heard that they killed Kashush. They cut his neck and removed his tongue. Malik heard about that story and then wrote his, his uh, part of his symphony about it and called it the uh, Kashush Symphony. And I even to all the lyrics. I said, you know, you guys keep the lyrics and just uh, take the music and uh, have an elegant symphonic work to be the bridge between the people there and the people here. I'm really honored to be in this outstanding university, Sydney Uni, especially in this department, the law school, which is about justice, about law, about the truth, and about seeking information. What really disturbed me really is the distortion of truth in the terminology. I heard crisis, civil war, um, conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a holocaust. We have Hitler of today, it's called Assad, gazing children to death as I speak to you, destroying the monuments of Syria, not only now since 2011, long time ago and I just can't imagine that if we have Hitler today gazing the Jews in Auschwitz we say you know what let's have a dialogue with Hitler and put him on a panel or put him on the news and see if we can have a peace uh, resolution no we take Hitler to justice and then we can talk about peace and we can talk about citizenship and we can talk about justice and, and, and anything else. I'm Syrian, I was born in Germany and when I moved to Syria when I was six years old I had this cultural shock when I went to school because every school I went had the portrait of Assad in the school, in the music school, in the theater, in the library in the mosque, everywhere. I mean even the images that the professor had of the mosques had Assad on them, because he is more important than God, which is shameful. 
Can you imagine the church like St. Mary? Here you have like the prime minister on the bell. It's funny, but that's what we have. That's what we have. And when I was in Syria, after singing the national anthem that doesn't mention Syria, I was forced to say the following statement, and now I'm having difficulty saying it, but I have to tell you. I was forced every morning at 7.32, after singing the national anthem, to say the following statement. Would you please close your eyes so I can just tell you what it is. Just close your eyes so you can digest those ugly words. I sacrifice my blood and my soul to Assad. Not to God, not to Jesus, not to Moses. I sacrifice my blood and my soul to Assad every morning. In the afternoon, I go to my papa, you've seen, a surgeon who studied in Vienna, and my mother, a physics and chemistry teacher, and they tell me, shut up, we don't want to hear this. Assad is not a good guy. So I will shut up in the afternoon so I can get Kit Kat and Mars. So I lied to my parents. I was rewarded for being a liar in the afternoon at home. In the morning, I go to my religion teacher, to my physics teacher, to my music teacher. I sacrifice my blood and my soul to Assad, who is on the mosque, on the church, on the synagogue, in the library. The only place they didn't put his portrait is the bathroom. That's the honest truth. So the more you lie, the more rewarded. That's when you become a minister of culture. And that's when you become Mr. President. Liar. A criminal. When I met the minister of culture of Syria in 2010, before the crisis, and I told him I have a project about the oldest music notation in the world from my home country, Syria. He has never heard about it. When I presented him this replica that I made, he asked me, is this the real one? I said, no, you moron, the real one is in the museum. This is not the real one. <laughs> That's how stupid leaders are. Going to the army, one of the suggestions from one of the panelists was loyalty to the Syrian army. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no Syrian army. Because remember when I have been brainwashed, I sacrificed my blood and my soul to Assad. The Syrian army today, after 50, 60 years of dictatorship, they put tattoos, Assad, or we burn Syria. That's the slogan of this army. Assad, or we burn the people, the Syria, the mosques, the synagogues, the Silk Road, the babies, millions of refugees. Assad is more important than people and humanity. And that's, can you imagine, airplanes going? To destroy an entire city like Aleppo takes an army. And when he couldn't do it, he invited the evil of the world to assist him in destroying my culture and my civilization, which is shameful. Really, really shameful. Going to my notes. Have you heard of Albert Camus? He said, no matter what cause one defends, it will suffer permanent disgrace if one resorts to blind attacks on crowds of innocent people. That's my favorite quote. Ladies and gentlemen, we have innocent people just like you and your children and your sisters and your professors and me being massacred now because somehow the world has silenced that war against all humanity and kept Hitler of today gassing children to death and forcing millions of families and professors and journalists. Who in this world, in this uh, room knows Marie Colvin? Raise your hand, you get a free album. Thank you, you get a free album, man. Marie Colvin, you get a gift from me. Marie Colvin is a journalist, American journalist. She was specialized in conflicts. When she was with Anderson Cooper from my city homes, Assad sent her a rocket and killed her. 
One is way too many. He killed her because he doesn't want to have reliable information. No journalists. The most number of journalists killed by Assad and his regime was in Syria and the world in the last two years. Babies, professors, my mother. We have a student from uh, Sydney University here. His father was shot by Assad in a peaceful demonstration in Homs. He is here among us. He was volunteering to sell some of my CDs. Where are you? Please stand up. Another witness from Homs. His father is just shot during a peaceful demonstration. Um, if you go to the UN headquarters in New York, you see 16,000 images of civilians tortured to death in the Assad prisons. Not in ISIS, and not in Russian regimes, and not in Lebanon, and not in all these distortion, distortion news. 16,000 images. Each image has sometimes 20, 30, 40, 50 bodies tortured to death in the Assad prisons. Samantha Power goes in, Ban Ki-moon, your UN ambassador, everybody was forced to see these images and nothing happened. I met with Samantha Power, my UN ambassador. I said, Sam, my government, the United States government, listed the Assad regime as a state sponsor of terrorism. When? If anybody, is know, anybody knows in this room when, you get another reward. Anybody, is, anybody knows when the United States government listed the Assad regime as a state sponsor of terrorism? Any students, researchers, anybody knows? Please give me a guess or a number. 2010? Excuse me? I'm sorry. In the 1990s? Closer. Any, any other guess? December 1979. I'm shocking you, right? Shame on us. I told her, shame on you. What have you done since December 1979 till 2017? A state sponsor of what? Who? I was raised in Homs. I have never heard of ISIS. I went to a Catholic school. The fundamental agenda of Assad is to distort information, kill journalists, mix it. Do you know the Matyushka Russian dolls? Do you know them? How many dolls usually? Seven, eight? Tuk, 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 you know, ISIS, this, this, Shia, Alawite, blah, 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 blah. But what is the first fundamental cause of the whole thing? Hitler, Assad of today. We never heard of Shia conflict. None of the mosques and synagogues have been destroyed in the last 5,000 years. All of a sudden, we have total destruction. The Syrian people just went crazy on, 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 on March 2011. They just all went crazy, and they want to go to the Mediterranean Sea and swim. Is that, does that make, make sense? They were facing evil. They said, we don't want to be violent. Let's go to the ocean and drown. Resting in peace rather than living in peace. They're drowning because they don't want to be part of this ugly reality. This is how peaceful the Syrian people are. My mother was in her bedroom. Can you imagine? One story about a Syrian child was in a, an operation room facing the doctors in what we call hospitals, similar to the hospital that your father went and they couldn't treat. They refused to treat his father because it was a law in Syria by the Hitler dictator. If you are in a demonstration and you got shot by the, by the police, you cannot be treated in any hospital. It's a law. You should go and die. They treated him in one of the houses. This little baby was on an operating room in one of the refugee camps. Looking up, this is a true story, basically dying from the wounds of injustice. Ladies and gentlemen, let's preserve our humanity about truth, justice. We are in a law school. Please don't fall into those traps of distortion and destruction. And let's, let's discuss the fundamental human values of justice and freedom. This baby 
kid was looking up, dying. The last thing he told the doctor, I'm going to tell God everything. And he died. Are we telling God everything? That story inspires me to keep going despite all the ugly events that I see. And, and I failed to give him a voice. Everywhere I go, I see this immense efforts to silence him. What did he do? A seven-year-old baby. What did he do? Was he in a political party? Was he discussing politics? The minute I discuss Assad, they told me, oh, you are political. I don't belong to a political party, neither that baby. I'm discussing a fundamental moral duty. The minute a bullet went to the head of these children in a peaceful demonstration, that doesn't become any political and all these distortions. This is a moral duty. This is a war against all humanity. All humanity, students and researchers, I urge you to write the truth. Where are your books? I heard there is a book here about Assad from this university. Shame on you. Where is the book about the baby? Where is the book about truth? This is the, this is the academic of justice and law, right? Go find the truth. Search for it and tell God everything. I'm a witness of a massacre of 40,000 civilians in 1981, me. I was watching Tom and Jerry, the cartoons. Do you know them? The mouse and the cat. And my dad came from the hospital. He's a doctor. He said, kids, let's go. We're going to have a car ride. 25 minutes, we went to Hama. He had a special permission to enter the city. From watching Tom and Jerry to watching a Holocaust, I saw caterpillars with dead bodies in 1981. I saw them in my own eyes. I asked Papa, who did this? He couldn't dare tell me the truth because they will kill him. Because if I go to school and I tell my religion teacher after I sacrifice my blood and my soul to Assad, they will kill me. And they have been killing people not only since 2011. Artists, journalists, he couldn't tell me. I go to the States, I find out that my president killed 40,000 people in one week. And they call him president. President of what? President of shame? President of war, crimes against all humanity? All what I want is peace. I can suggest one solution. I'm not a politician, but I might be maybe crazy. But here's the solution, very simple. The Syrian people, who are now half of them refugees, million plus dead, killed, and another 11 million displaced inside Syria, those are the Syrian people. And you have one student here. The Syrian people, like you, minus dictatorship, which is Assad and his gang and whoever he brought along. I'm not going to talk about proxy war and all that stuff, but that's the evil of the world, head by this dictator. The Syrian people minus Assad equals peace. Very simple. Get rid of that fundamental cause of terrorism since 1979. Let the people struggle and go crazy maybe for five, seven years, but they're not going to destroy Aleppo because the Syrian people never destroyed any synagogues or mosques, or churches, never. The Muslims never destroyed mosques or the Silk Road 
or synagogues. Never. That's why we still have them standing until March 2011. That's the proof. All of a sudden we have a, a brutal dictator destroying my identity and my culture and he wants to actually destroy the beauty of our diversification. The Syrian people don't need to go to Sydney Uni and learn about tolerance or diversity. You can see an ignorant Syrian in Homs or Aleppo who never went to school. He said, oh, this synagogue is my synagogue. And this church is in my neighborhood. This is my neighborhood, my church, and this is mosque. He doesn't differentiate because that's his identity by organic fact on the ground. It's part of his neighborhood. The synagogue is part of his neighborhood. And in my music, I take that music, I have an example that I just displayed on ABC. You hear the same tune in the synagogue with Hebrew or any other language, sometimes Arabic. You hear it in Assyrian or Aramaic in some of the churches where Jesus Christ was one day. Can you imagine? Has been destroyed. And you hear it in the mosque and you hear it on public transportation, the same tune. The music unites everyone. I think this is my presentation. All what I hope for is peace. I don't belong to any political party. I'm giving you facts, not opinions. I urge you to search for beauty and truth and don't be distorted by all this fake news. And I want to end my segment with one question. Is there anybody here in this room that supports Assad? Raise your hand. Seriously, I just, I'm curious. Anybody in this room that supports Assad? Anybody here in the room that supports the Syrian people? Raise your hand. Thank you. The Syrian people, regardless of their religion and age and ethnic groups, please be a human. The Syrian people need your support. When politics failed and journalists are being assassinated and you have academic institution being polluted by this agenda. I mean, I can't be more shameful when I have professors at prestigious academic institutions in the US, I've seen it in my own eyes, in Europe, journalists. One story, I have a journalist in Spain. The Queen of Spain came to my concert and I had a little interview and I have an interpreter. And the journalist, the Spanish journalist, asked me, what is going on in Syria? I said, oh, it's very simple. We have a dictator killing the children. The interpreter said, we have a problem and children are dying. See? The, see the terminology, students and researchers? I said, no, we have a dictator killing the children. She said, problemo and, and kids are dying. Two times. I said, ma'am, dictator, problemo. Dictator problemo. I said, now it's a problemo, no more interview. <laughs> Please pay attention to those terminologies. Crisis, civil war, civil war of what? Have you seen like a civil war of clashes? It's, 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 it's not a civil war. Migrants, I went to Oxford University and they said the effect of migrants on Europe. Migrant, I have never heard the term migrant in my life. I heard refugees, immigrants. Uh, I opened the dictionary, uh, the, the Oxford Dictionary, migrant, 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 before my panel, like I was doing today. Number one, the definition of migrant, an animal migrating, usually a bird. An animal migrating? That's the definition of migrant in the dictionary of Oxford, not me. Number two, a seasonal worker looking for a job. Seriously? I learned that the baby that you saw on the shores and the people who are drowning in the Mediterranean are animals and seasonal workers? Shame on us to accept these terminologies. Those are humans. Babies are humans, ladies and gentlemen. This is a crime against all humanity and if we don't stand up with our common share of humanity as humans, as Australians, as Americans. Look what we, what we have in the White House. It's our results. We need to protect ourselves because if we don't, we're gonna face ugly times. I thank you for your humanity. I thank you for your time, which is the most valuable asset you have. I'm honored to be here. 
And I have only seen kindness and hospitality, especially after my Sydney Opera House a couple of days ago. Thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of the Syrian children and peace. Thank you. Um, just heard a very, very compelling speech by Malik Dali, and also um, uh, very thought-provoking uh, presentations on the situation, as our title of the forum is tonight, about the abuses of human rights and the destruction of culture in Syria. I'd like now to call our moderator, Dr. Wendy Lamborn, to ask the presenters to come on stage. And what we'd like to do is just have a question and answer and to ask those of you who'd like to have some questions to ask of the panel to please stand on the side so that we could have um, people to um, be in a queue with the uh, microphones so we could have just some questions from the audience. So could I please ask the panel presenters to please come on stage? So um, thank you. I've just been checking that over here that we will have about 15 minutes of questions and apologies for, for running over with the time because of the chair situation at the beginning and our very enthusiastic speakers who we've um, all learnt a lot from. Um, thank you. And I think we have our first question here. And then if anybody else wants to ask a question, please go up there and we might take a few questions at a time um, to... Um, move things along. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, this has been a very thought-provoking um, series of presentations on a very complex topic that has been going on for much too long than what it needs to and with, with great uh, tragedy. Um, my, my question is actually um, to the gentleman, sorry, the first one, I, I, I can't remember your name. Yes. Um, but you spoke about um, um, institutional um, uh, uh, need for getting uh, greater involvement um, around um, um, uh, uh, I guess my question is, well, what can institutions actually do? Um, and, and institutions in terms of um, country institutions, or government institutions, or supernatural institutions, and is there institutions anywhere in the world that actually are doing things um, that, 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 that maybe need to be doing more? Um, you know, is this the United Nations? Is it uh, uh, the EU? Um, um, not sure you know, uh, what America can do in terms of their institutions, um, Russian institutions, um, but what can institutions do given that humans uh, are, are quite challenged to do anything individually? Okay, thanks. Do you want to collect questions? Um, well, at the moment we seem to only have one, so please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, yeah. uh, it's a very good question. I think when, when I talk about the institution in this case, or institutions, um, when we deal with something, as, as you say, as complex that deals with so many areas, the areas of security, areas of, of interests, of economic interests, of, of human rights, and so on, then we look at, at the broad picture, then we are generally looking at either the UN or at regional organizations. But both the UN and regional organizations are made of states. So I think it's a combination of, of both. Uh, in terms of, for example, decision-making at the level of the UN or, or regional organizations, then the UN is partly a professional organization with people that work based on the spirit and, and the uh, charter of the UN. But a lot of the uh, main uh, organs of the UN that make the important decisions are made up of political representatives of states. Um, so I would say that largely uh, a combination of everything that has to do with mass atrocity prevention, with uh, human rights protection. Uh, a lot has been done, but obviously not enough. So I think, I think uh, international law, the, the creation and development of international law has a lot to do with that as well. Uh, the responsibility to protect that was uh, instigated uh, at the beginning of this, uh, of this century. Uh, uh, and ha is a common jargon being used, but not so much in terms of, of being applied, is something that uh, 
is, is we aspire to over, over, over time uh, become part of international law as well. So, so yes, I don't have a better answer, unfortunately. It's a good question. <laughs> Hello, uh, this is Gizam. I'm from Turkey. I used to work for UNHCR for five years, so I was interviewing Syrians, Syrian refugees on the spot. Also, we went to the fields. Um, especially while we were leaving, we saw that there are huge preservation, uh, reservations towards uh, the refugee influx, and especially due to the how can I, xenophobia, Islamophobia, people in Europe, in uh, Western countries, they had these reservations. And as you may know, uh, Alan Kurdi died in the Turkey offshore, in the, on the beaches, and Omran Dakresh, he was, how can I say, he was hospitalized, and he was in the ambulance ambulance chair and immediately the reaction changed the, uh, the pe especially the people's reaction in Turkey people uh, at that time they had so many reservations they were complaining about the existence of Syrians but uh, it, when they, when they saw these photographs it changed their reaction changed it started from the top to the bottom people in the Europe said that welcome refugees so uh, you may know from uh, Angela Merkel, they also invited refugees, so they had this open door policy. So is, I, I'm trying to understand, while we were working, working on the field, pe people were having their reservations, but once there's a few photographs, and all the policies are changing, so I'm trying to understand how we can increase the awareness of the public op opinion, and why is it so difficult to change the politician's approach because you know Trump's policy, current policy is not so friendly towards the refugees, towards the immigrants, and especially these seven um, countries listed. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any particular person you're asking the question to? Uh, or just mine is a little bit more towards the uh, Dr. Eyal's uh, speech because I really found his um, how can I say explanations really to the point. Uh, you were trying to, how can I say, explain the, I don't want to say hypocrisy, but people are paying more sympathy towards the deaths in Europe, but they're not paying too much attention to the, how can I say, crisis in Syria. And now it's not just Syria, we have the problems in Iraq. There are people suffering in Iran due to the regime. So I'm trying to, yeah, I would like to get your opinions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for a good question. Um, I don't think that anyone in this room would have been here if they didn't feel very strongly about uh, such issues. But if you look at the, at the general, at what we call the general public or mass opinion, it's often not very representative of what we have here. So, for example, the Syrian conflict in 2011 uh, attracted 12% of the American people in terms of following the news. Uh, when you know hundreds of thousands of people are being massacred, people are so on one hand protected by their own mental, you know, me protection mechanisms, and on the other hand, so preoccupied with their lives that people outside our immediate uh, uh, moral concerns are often neglected. So I think, I think uh, the story of Alan Cordy did make headlines. Did make. Uh, you know, I think in Canada they had some legislation uh, put in place after the story uh, broke out. It's just an example of how how we can empathize with children. I think, as Malik mentioned, the, the personal story of children, but how difficult it is to translate the story of one child into uh, our willingness to mobilize for something, especially if the situation is so problematic, so difficult. And when it comes to our politician, which I think is the second part of your question, polit politicians are trained, and I, I don't want to make generalization, but politicians are trained to think of serving their own, the interests of their own people as they perceive it, and I'm talking about democracies, not about Syria, uh, as a moral duty. So then the question is, how do you prioritize the welfare of the Australian people over the welfare of the, or the protection of the Syrian people. And politicians are not, unfortunately, many of them are not very good at that. There are exceptions, and when I meet with policymakers, I find amazing people who chose to work in this area and who need help 
to convince their governments, but governments will always work based on interests, based on political calculations. And that's why I think it's important to make such a change in public opinion because politicians would listen to public opinion. But I also tried to explain why it's so difficult to change public opinion. I hope it's a good answer. Thank you. Um, and did you want to make a comment on that one? I have, I have yeah. a comment. I have a question. Do you know who stopped the Vietnam War in the US? Who stopped the Vietnam War? Anybody knows? Huh? Yeah, but in particular, in particular, one picture and the students of universities. One picture and the students. I truly believe academic institutions and students are the solution. And that's why the asset propaganda, in my example of Syria, is having a global, global agenda to pollute and distort truth in academic institutions. I have seen it in my own eyes. I was almost banned from Columbia University in the United States in, in, in New York. Can you imagine? Did you see that video I showed today? That was almost banned at Columbia University, at an academic institution. I canceled my concert in order to show this video because they accused me of being political. Um, so I truly believe academic institutions are the key and the evil of the world and the dictators have, have that in their calculation. They know how effective students are and they know how art. That's why they brought the entire orchestra to Palmyra. Remember when they liberated quote unquote Palmyra? What did they do? Anybody knows? You get a gift? <laughs> do you know what they did? Huh? Yes, yes, please. Orchestra. They destroy Aleppo, they bomb the whole thing, and then they bring the orchestra. Look how civilized we are. The Russian and the Assad government. Yes, yes. And then the other orchestra that was going to Latakia sadly dropped. So, I mean, they are effectively using art, education, and that's why they are actually targeting journalists. That's why we don't have reliable information, because no journalists are allowed. I invite any researcher at Sydney Uni, go to Syria and, and report around. Can you? Can anybody go? You're not allowed to go. You can't access information. If you shake, unless it has, yeah. You have to go again. So okay. uh, it is the distortion of facts, and, and, and that's what I want to clarify. Yep, thank you. Um, so we have two, two people standing up here with questions. Yes. So can I ask you both, and thank you for the second questioner for reminding me that I forgot at the beginning, to ask you please just to say quickly your name and your affiliation if you have one. And if you could both ask your questions and then we'll go to um, having um, the answers from whoever is appropriate. Thank okay. you. Uh, and to hi. make it as, as pointed to the question as possible. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Karen. Um, I work for a small NGO, growing NGO, called the Organization for World Peace. I've toyed with the idea of music for peace for a long time. I'm very taken aback. I think it's amazing. Um, I guess my question is basically, how did you kind of get the idea? Did it come from the fact that you could hear the same kind of melody in a few different places from a few different kind of regions or religions or something like that? Because I've noticed that myself, my background is Serbian. Uh, we have a lot of Turkish influence, Middle Eastern influence, European influence in our music. So yeah, I guess that's my question. Just kind of where did it come from? How did you kind of get to this point? Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, my, uh, I've got uh, two small questions. Uh, the first one is for Eyal and um, uh, particularly uh, Malik. Um, and your name and affiliation, sorry. Oh, my name is uh, Aimé. I'm a PhD student in uh, post-war reconstruction. So, uh, so my question to you, Malek, and possibly Eyal, if I could also assist, um, it's to do with the scenarios. Yeah? So we are in 2017. We all, I imagine most of us here, want to see a resolution, want to see uh, criminal accountability established, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But we also, uh, it's difficult, as you said, to, to get information and everything. But can you, with the information that you have and uh, the passion that you have, uh, can you 
dispassionately sort of uh, come up with two or three possible scenarios. Uh, how will Syria be in the next two, three years, or in the next sort of 10 years? What are the key challenges that we're going to have? Uh, Assad might go, will go at some point. Uh, and what are the key sort of, diff uh, the, the most sort of difficult sort of scenarios that you see uh, drawing themselves in the next uh, two to three years, but also in the mid and long term. Um, and uh, the, the other small question for, for Dr. Burns. Um, the president of, um, uh, no, not the president, the secretary general of the UN recently said that uh, developed countries need to increase the, the uh, intake of refugees. Uh, and that is just one of the, 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 the solutions or the, the, some of the, the ways of alleviating the suffering of the Syrian refugees who are uh, uh, in big numbers in those neighboring countries. From uh, your sort of a different uh, um, uh, diplomatic sort of experience, why is it that Australia cannot increase its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its intake, uh, knowing what we know uh, now or what we've even known since the war sort of began. Yeah? Um, and then the, 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 the third small question again to Malik, uh, it's pretty much related to the, the question that I had. It's on, uh, you know, with, uh, you know you, you, you've got your own president who has a particular position on Syria. You've got the EU countries that keep sort of changing their positions. Uh, you've got Russia, uh, and we are in a multipolar world. Uh, this is back again to the question. You two can sort of take that question on uh, empathy, but also response. Uh, the French president just four days ago said that he's no longer having as one of the possible scenarios uh, a post-war political dispensation without uh, Assad because he has not seen any sort of alternative, quote unquote. And for many people, many people were, were, were discouraged by that. They were uh, surprised, surprised by that. Uh, if you could sort of comment on, uh, on that uh, in relation to the question that uh, the first person sort of asked about the role of institutions. I'm asking the role of countries that traditionally are the ones that have power to intervene and, um, and stop the carnage. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that's ended our question time from the point of view of questions. So um, if I can ask each of our speakers to comment briefly <laughs> um, in answer to those two questions. Thanks. Sure. Do you want me? Yes, sure. oh, I only got a very small question. So that was the one about... Um, Re refugees? Is that working? Oh, you use this one. It's okay. Um, the, the question was about refugees. I mean, it's 13 years since I worked for the government. Um, and all I can go on is what the government says about why, they, why they've limited the intake of Syrian refugees. I mean, it's basically because the processing of uh, the security and processing is so long these days, and they've limited it to 12,000, which is probably all that can be handled you know, in a reasonable amount of time. That's, that's all I know, but I mean, let's not forget that uh, we at least have a decent process for processing people, um, and we have to do... Did you say decent? Sorry. I did say decent. Is that wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> we have an organised process. For, okay, would you like to give a talk, or shall I continue? Anyway, it's not my responsibility, but I'm not, I'm not ducking it. But I would say that we, we have an intake which is much bigger than the American intake. Uh, it's smaller than the Canadian intake, but, you know, it's certainly not minuscule. And it's probably a reasonable estimate of what we could handle for the next few years. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's the only way in which one, one can approach it. Um, sorry, was there... Some other aspect that I had to I think comment there on. May I, okay. may I take a chair's privilege for a minute? Or yeah, the, sure. Or yeah. The, 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 what am I? Moderator's privilege. <laughs> um, while each of you is answering, because we won't have time for more questions, I wanted to ask each of you also to just say, hmm, a, like, a point, not, rather than a whole sentence or. Yeah, sure. Um, 
um, discussion, but just like what if there's one thing that you would think that, pe that um, could be done right now to support, or what is the most important thing to support some kind of peaceful resolution moving forward? Because okay. the challenge at the moment is, yes, we would like to see the end. We would like to see the end to the humanitarian yeah. things going on. But just one thing which might be about how you might see that people in the room could do or be or feel or how somebody could be acting. So the, the very quick version of that. And if you want to go first, or do you want to come back? No, I'll you? do it now. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. That, that was one thing that was frustrating me this evening. We didn't have much consideration of what the future might be. I think the reality is that instead of moving towards a solution, we're getting more and more people tumbling onto this issue and trying to make, project their own concerns on it. And the latest one, of course, is the one I referred to in, in uh, President Trump's intervention, which he is more or less encouraging a sort of a, a ramping up of the conflict between the Shia, Shia and Sunni states in the Middle East. This is the last thing you need in order to get a resolution in Syria. But it's not the only complication which has been coming in in recent years. I mean, the biggest one is the, is the presence of ISIS. That may be something which is waning. Um, but we need to get a whole lot of people to back off, to stop trying to project their problems, their shibboleths, their tensions onto Syria. You know, you can now list about 10 or 12 different entities. I think you, know, you did actually have a list which was fairly comprehensive. But we need all these states to be backing off and to be working out some way in which this can all be uh, dampened down and the basic issues be resolved. And of course, yeah. the basic issue, as as uh, Malik has said, is the Assad regime and its record of, of brutality and, and, and violence. So, go, so go backing but, off and going back to root causes. Yeah, yep. and to put the pressure on the Assad regime to reform one way or another. And the Russians, of course, are the, cue to the, are the key to this, and to some extent the Iranians. But to try to stir up another dimension to the whole conflict spreading over the whole of the Shia and Sunni world in the Middle East is just crazy. So that's my solution. Back off. Thank you. Thank you for that challenge to do this briefly. I know yeah. you have a lot to say. I want to answer the questions about... Yes, please. Uh, about Pianos for Peace. Um, when please I answer the musical question. The musical <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah. When I, <laughs> when I saw the horrific pictures of my mother having a black eye and broken teeth, and blood on her face. I said to myself, can, can music do that? I mean, did my music cause that for someone to make such an ugly act and go after my mother? So I thought to myself, maybe I can create music that will do the opposite, turning an ugly act into a peaceful act. And that was my inspiration to do Pianos for Peace. What we do, we paint pianos. Actually, I almost painted one and put it at the, near the parliament when you have homeless people there. Uh, I've seen all these homeless people in front of the parliament. Um, we, we, we paint pianos, we make the arts accessible to all, and then we donate them after the public art display to, to hospitals, nursing homes, and Title I schools in an effort to spread peace. Um, that was one of the questions. The other question was some sort of... Um, how do I see, what, what are the threats or what is the... Uh, how, how would you see Syria in a few years' time? After? I mean, you know, again, please, I'm not... What would be important to... I'm not a politician and I can't predict the future, but what I can, what I can tell you, we are 10,000 years old. 60 years of dictatorship might destroy Aleppo, but there are seven more Aleppos underneath Aleppo. So the identity of the Syrian people has been only distorted and destroyed by dictatorship. When you are hijacking the humanity from the soldier where he is bombing his own family, that's destruction. But I see Syria much more beautiful because I do the analogy of like a volcano, which is God made. When God decides to have a volcano in Hawaii and destroys Hawaii and the rivers and the meadows and the butterflies and the beautiful flowers, everything turns black. But what happens? 
after their destruction, a more fertile soil comes. That's nature, not me. More beautiful butterflies will, will come up, more greenery. And that's how I see Syria, and I'm not, I'm not dreaming. The only threat I, I see is the lost generation that is the product of this Holocaust. I mean, please refer to the babies Holocaust survivors. Those are Holocaust survivors fleeing chambers of gas and chemical attacks and all that stuff. That lost generation worries me the most. They are free, but they have no identity. Ladies and gentlemen, we have babies being born now as I speak to you. They have no identification. Okay, what is the future of that baby? He is now five, six years old. Millions of them. To me, that's a dangerous formula for all the symptoms that we discussed. I don't want to even say it. And, and the response to lack people in concentration camps on an island or in Guantanamo or in Syria or in Palestine is not the solution. Concentration camps are not the solution. And I had the honor to meet uh, Vanessa Redgrave at the Sydney Film Festival. And um, she said that the Australian government, it's not me I'm quoting, is illegal. And I just ended there. That wasn't me. <laughs> that was Oscar winner Vanessa Redgrave. <laughs> He's not Australian, but that wasn't a comment. Um, okay. <laughs> um, hey, uh, um, Okay, so I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be answering exactly, but there's a few comments that I did want to make. Is one is that um, we vote when we vote uh, our politicians in. We, and when I say we, I mean most people vote them in on domestic issues, not on foreign, not on what is happening far away in in not well known parts of the world. And, and that's a big problem. Um, I think the Syrian conflict is a very difficult case of what we call peace versus justice. It's a situation where a dictator remains in power, and then what do you, how do you pr prioritize? Do you prioritize justice or do you prioritize peace? Because real peace is peace with justice. But, but until then and until things change, what do you do? And I think. Malik has brought a very, very problematic issue up on, into the surface, which unfortunately I don't have great answers for. What do you prioritize, peace or justice, at this point in relation to Syria? Uh, what we can do, I think, is start at home, start little, start around us. Fight racism wherever we see it, because the people in Syria have their dignity, but people around us, whether they're refugee or whether they're minorities, also have their dignity. And I think this is very important to understand that a democracy, one of the main yardsticks to, to test democracy is how it, treats, how it treats its minorities. So this is something we can all, all do at every day in our lives. Um, I think, uh, an example with Trump and the missiles just recently with the chemical weapon is a classic example how governments can, can fool us because, oh, we bombed, we bombed Assad and that's it. We can go home. We feel good about, about ourselves. And how governments are treating us a lot of the time is by selling us rhetoric and selling us half-measure uh, actions to pacify our consciousness. Or, sorry, consciousness. So this is something, again, that can be done is by not letting uh, elected politicians get away with, with doing things that are not really helping. So uh, I don't, again, don't have magic bullet solutions for Syria. I think uh, military action is never the answer. It's always about uh, diplomatic and political solutions. So I on very rare occasions, safe zones or no-fly zones can be very helpful in saving lives. Whether or not this is something that can apply to Syria uh, is something that is certainly worth the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you. And thank you for bringing us back to reminding us that the war is not the answer in that sense. And that one thing we've learned tonight from everybody, and we already know, but that all sides, and I say sides, meaning cohes everybody is suffering in Syria, even I think Assad was Syrian, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but everybody in that sense is suffering. Everybody at some level is um, um, contributing in different ways. Yeah, so I'm not meaning to say undermine that there are victims, but what happens is that over time in a conflict, that people who are victims become perpetrators as well, and the conflict becomes so much more complex to try to resolve because people have, have got caught up in um, the fears, the, sorry, have got caught up in the fears, the blame, the threat, the defence, and that kind of dynamic that keeps a conflict appearing to be intractable is what we need to break in, in relation to Syria. So how can we all do that? And I think one of the things you said was bringing it back home in terms of tackling racism, for example. It's like how do we each individually and, and in what we um, stand for um, help to bring unity, as, as Malik was saying before, how do we help to bring unity in our and, and a peaceful approach to whatever we do. I could say a lot more as, a, as somebody who um, believes in the peaceful resolution of conflict and yet that challenge of what's going on right now um, in relation to um, the choices that have to be made. And I think Al also said that earlier about compromise that might not look like, you know, we can't always get a win-win, we can't always get um, uh, the win-win that we might want, but we can try to avoid the worst of the lose-lose by thinking about maybe there's some kind of compromises that have to be made that hurt, that may be able to move things forward to get to some kind of peaceful place where justice can then be pursued. Okay, that's my roundup. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just for the, and, and to invite Patricia back just to, to um, end the proceedings. Thank you. Just to say, um, with the closing, and I know that we've all stayed a little bit later, but um, I think you can all agree, we've had an extremely um, inspiring, and I, and I feel, um, uh, sort of a stirring um, call for us now to really, um, uh, I feel, um, question now um, the sorts of threats of, to our humanity that we're facing in this world today and the presentations this evening, um, particularly in the situation with the war in Syria, um, is calling on all of us now to think about what each of us can do in relation to how we can deal with the threats to humanity and also to recover our humanity. So I'd um, just like to say thank you very much to the panels, panelist speakers for their uh, very, very inspirational, illuminating um, presentations. I'd like to thank the audience, to thank you for your participation in the discussion and also um, to uh, acknowledge the support of um, firstly Karen Collier of Brave Media. <laughs> and also the panels has been supported by the Council for Peace with Justice the Near Eastern Archaeology Foundation at the University of Sydney, and thanks again to Sydney Ideas. Good night. Thank you very much.